It's early November 2014 and the EDSAC team are beginning to join up pieces of the machine. EDSAC is now in the commissioning phase. We've put many of the racks, the chassis that our volunteers have built into the racks. We have power coming into the racks. We're starting to make the connections with these wires that link across between the chassis, delivering signals from one part of the computer to another. As part of that commissioning, therefore, we find ourselves using tools like this oscilloscope. We can monitor the signals coming out of a chassis. These are generating clock and digit pulses and trace them round to other parts of the machine where they're being used. So the standard signal is coming in here. Yeah. So here we have John and Peter who are working on debugging the store addressing system, taking some of the clock signals coming from the other side. John, how's it going? Not very well because the signals coming from the other side there are a, a little bit larger than I, I work with on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, they're causing disturbance in the flip-flop circuit, causing premature resetting. Right. Because it's basically the signals bouncing up and down. So what we're going to try and do is simply use standard components and attenuate the signals to prove the point that there's a sort of incompatibility. So your plan is to put some extra resistance in to reduce the size of the signal to the level you need? So it's all switched on now, but I'm being very brave because I'm going to take this wire off, which is the blue clock signal. And that clock signal is now flowing through me to nowhere. <laughs> and connect it to these two resistors, one to ground, I think I'll have to use solder, and basically reduce the height of the signal by 50%. So it should reduce the amount of noise that's flying around. Good. And do you think this is the kind of thing that would have gone on with the pioneers when they were well, building the original? <laughs> the signals are so noisy. They, you know, they, they come in from one mm. rack to another and they bounce. And, right. And there's wow. noise on the HD. So we're learning a lot about <laughs> what it was like. In order to get a project like this to work, you really need people who are familiar with valve technology, vacuum tube technology. There's hardly any of us left. And those volunteers are still hard at work. On the outskirts of Reading, one of the 20 or so EDSAC volunteers, James Barr, is assembling some of the remaining chassis in his garden shed. On the EDSAC project, I've been responsible for design work for the order coding system and for the master control unit. These two systems consist of 12 chassis and three chassis, respectively. The order coding chassis um, deal with the fact that in the memory of the computer, instructions are coded as a number uh, consisting of five bits. This particular chassis is a register which stores two of the bits out of those five. One bit is stored in one half of the chassis and the other bit is stored in the other half. From his farmhouse on the edge of the Welsh borders, Chris Burton has overseen the project from the very start. Master in charge of authenticity. This is one of the store regeneration units, of which there are 41 in the EDSAC, uh, which is used for regenerating the data travelling through the delay tanks, the acoustic delay tanks, and the various tuning coils in the machine, here and here, uh, which are to do with that. And the question is, where do we get tuning coils like that from? And the answer is you can't buy them these days. All you can buy these days are little tiny coils like this, which really are totally out of scale for our replica. So we are driven to finding a way of making new coils like the original. So there's nothing for it but for Chris to make about a hundred of these coils himself. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, It's typical of much of the work for the project, a cottage industry combined with a lot of ingenuity. We now end up with a wound coil almost identical with the one in the original machine. One of the things in this chassis is in fact a sixth inductance. Uh, here is an example here, um, which is actually an inductance in parallel with a resistor. Here is one of the 1940s vintage resistors of the type that was used in the original machine and we're fortunate enough to have quite a quantity of these uh, and in this case we're not too fussed 
about whether this resistor has changed value over the decades uh, because it's just acting as a damper for the inductance winding. So what's happened is a winding, a coil, an inductance coil, has been wound onto one of these resistors. And we can do that uh, in the lathe here with the wire, uh, a suitable wire, wound onto the resistor. So that will do. Here we are with the finished wire, the wound coil. We have to solder the enamel copper wire onto the terminations there, but essentially what, what we've made is a replica of the um, inductance that we wanted in the first place. With the machine taking shape behind him, Martin Campbell Kelly reminds us why EDSAC is important. Well, the EDSAC's important for two reasons. Well, first, of course, it was the first practical computer to be completed. That's a computer of the modern type. But the second thing, which not so many people know about, is that it also invented the whole business of programming. Um, and so ideas such as subroutines are still widely used inside computers today, and they were all started by the EDSAC. We would like the museum to be able to offer modern students uh, a sense of what it was like to run a program in the 1950s. Um, so uh, the plan is that we will be able to uh, allow students to write programs, um, perhaps uh, at their own house using a simulator program. They'll be able to come down here uh, with a USB stick, we'll get it converted to paper tape for them and hopefully their programs will work uh, on the EdSec.